joined now by the head coach at Texas A&M, Mike Elko. And, uh, and coach, is, has anything actually calmed down for you? I realize you're, you're now throwing strikes off the mound for Jim Schlossnagel. Uh, things have gone well so far, but is it, is it, does it ever slow down? No, I, I'm obviously the, the month of February helps a little bit and, and it's an opportunity for you to get around your guys and spend a little bit more time in College Station and, and not having to travel and not having recruits come on campus. Not that recruiting ever slows down, but it is it is a nice opportunity to just kind of catch your breath and start to build some roots in College Station around this program and where you want this thing to go. How, how much does it help that you did spend four years there? before you went to Duke and and were around for, you know, the recruiting process for a lot of these guys on this roster? Yeah, I think it helps with familiarity. I think it helps you as you start making connections, building relationships, uh, starting this process of getting with people. I, I think you're in a much better starting point because you've got a, such a strong base for, for what this place is about, what this community is about, what the school's about. Uh, I think where you're starting from is at a much more elevated level, and that can only help as you start to build the foundation of this. I heard you talking about uh, between year one and year two at Duke, you were talking about that first year at Duke, and you're talking about you know, when you first become head coach, you have no idea how many different directions you're going to be pulled. What's it like the second time when, you, when you've been through that process once? Are you a little better prepared for it? Yeah, I, I think so, but I also think the timing of this was so different when I got to Duke, fortunately, it was it was towards the end of the December recruiting period, which you know limited our ability to do things in recruiting, but but also gave me an opportunity to really kind of hunker down and and build the staff, get together with the players. You know, when you take over in the beginning of December in the modern world of college football, you know, there's an awful lot of things going on at that point that you're trying to manage. And so uh, having the preparation help, I don't know if it was an apples to apples type comparison. Well, and especially with this one, I think people look at, at the recruiting classes and recruiting rankings for Texas A&M in the last few years. But you had some work to do with the roster because they, they'd lost quite a bit to the portal. You, you had to you had to get the numbers right. Yeah, I mean, we had we had some some massive deficiencies in certain areas that we had to hit really, really well in the January portal. And, um, you know, we were able to do some things in December, but I think the majority of what we were we were primed to do uh, was in December and, or in January. And so, you know, we went into January knowing we needed to fill some critical spots. And I think we came out of January in a much better position with where this roster is and what it looks like moving forward. Well, and I know a lot of that is kind of speed dating, but I'm very curious about Nick Scorton, who, who you got from Purdue, but he's from Bryan, Texas. He's basically from in town. How aware of were you of him when you were the D.C. at A&M and he was in high school? Yeah, very much so, because that was actually my area. So when I was here as the D.C., I recruited the, recruited the local schools. And so um, I got a chance to watch him move around as a sophomore. And, and I told him this when we got him on campus for his visit. I said, if you had told me you were going to be 280 at that time, I'd have been much more excited <laughs> about bringing it here. Um, but he was kind of one of those middle linebackers with the big structure that you thought maybe, but you didn't really know what his body was really going to turn into. And, you know, and now he comes back a couple of years later as a, you know, 280 pound, big physical defensive end with a tremendous amount of production in the big 10 and the guy that we're really excited we were able to get back here. So you, you worked for a long time with Dave Clawson before going out on, on your own as a DC, but you were at Fordham with him and Bowling Green and Wake Forest. And I'm curious, how much did working at those schools hone your eye in terms of, what you're looking for in a recruit, does it change how you how you look at raw talent versus upside and development capability? Yeah, I think, and, and I've said this a couple of times, Andy, I think our goal and our job is to make sure we recruit a roster that at the end of each cycle has a significant amount of NFL talent on it. And, and I think if you look around the country, the teams that are winning and playing for this thing have a lot of NFL talent. I think, um, you know, my background being from smaller schools all the way up to Texas A&M and being a part of signing these big number one ranked recruiting classes, you realize that NFL talent comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. And maybe you uh, have an appreciation for what, what you're looking for in a kid 
that maybe predicts what his future looks like in your program and what type of productivity you can get from him. Is it, and does that change your view of, of how we look at, cause I, I work for a company where we, we, we hand out star ratings and that sort of thing. I would imagine you come at that from, with it, with a very different view because you started your career and spent what, 15, 20 years recruiting guys that didn't have star rankings. Yeah, listen, we want to recruit five stars that are evaluated by Texas A&M as five stars. And that's no disrespect to, to on three. And we got a lot of respect for the job that you guys do and the work that you do. Um, we just might not always see eye to eye on it. And, right. and, um, yeah, and, and we were here and when I was here at Texas A&M, I think we did some very similar things. You know, we signed some of the top defensive players in the state of Texas. We got a DeMarvin Leal. We got a Jalen Jones. Those were five star kids that were extremely highly coveted kids. And then, you know, we went and we found a three star kid in East St. Louis named Antonio Johnson, who we thought was a five star talent and, and was wired the right way. And he made the all rookie team, according to ESPN this year for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And so I, I think we are trying to sign the best kids at their position across the country. Um, I just think there's maybe a little bit of a different picture that we put into what defines the best kids at each position. One, one other thing I imagine spending so much time on, on a Dave Clawson staff, he has sent me the list of the restaurants that he tries to hit when he's, when he's recruiting. When you are on his staff, how nice is it when the head coach shows up for some of those in-home visits? Cause it, it seems like you're going to get some nice dinners out of it too. Yeah. So, so Dave and I, uh, completely different tastes on food. Um, Dave was always a food carnosaur. Um, I always felt like the local neighborhood Applebee's was the right spot. And so, um, yeah, it was interesting him and I working together as long as we did, um, with some, some slightly different views on what we were looking for when we were going out to dinner together on the road. We will not get into how many riblets you can put down when they do the <laughs> all you can eat riblets, but that it's look, let's just say my number has been high in the past. Um, I, I am, I am curious about, so Tommy Moffitt is your strength coach. And, and for those who don't know, Tommy Moffitt was LSU strength coach from 2000 to 2021. So the, through the Nick Saban, Les Miles and Ed Orgeron eras. And I heard him interviewed and he said, he actually called you first. Yeah. So, it, you know, it was interesting. Obviously, Dave Feely did a great job for us at Duke. And um, for some personal family reasons, he he decided he was going to stay in Durham. And and so we were out looking for who was going to be our new guy here. And, you know, Tommy Moffitt actually was one of the people who reached out and said, I got I got a lot of interest in the job. And so, you know, that's obviously a call that you have to take. You can't you can't not take the call from the legend of the strength and conditioning industry uh, across college football. And, and when I got on the phone, I think two things jumped out to me really, really quickly. You know, one was uh, how modernized his thoughts were uh, and how much he has evolved over the years to kind of match what sports science has brought to, to strength and conditioning, what load management and GPS systems have brought and just kind of his integrating that into what is still at its core an, an old school program. Uh, and then just his hunger still, you know, I think he's a guy who's obviously accomplished so much in college football and in strength and conditioning, but is, is extremely hungry to go build another program, leave his mark on another university. And I think is extremely hungry to get back into that national championship picture. And when you combine those two things, I don't know that there's much more you could be looking for. Well, and, and you've been in this industry a long time. What does it say about a guy that he was the guy for three different administrations and, and three different coaching staffs that won national titles? Yeah, I mean, it says everything. And then when we went into the process, this was something we talked about. We did this at Duke, and I think it was important here for us, too. You know, everybody talks about the strength and conditioning coach being an integral piece of building the culture in your program. A lot of times as we look at, at what makes a successful strength and conditioning coach, a big part of it is just program success because – if that's really the guy that's building the culture and that's the guy that's building a lot of those intangible qualities that lead to winning, uh, what you want is a strength and conditioning coach that has won. And when you can identify someone who has won at the highest level under multiple regimes with different philosophies and different head coaching styles, uh, I think it just speaks to the quality of culture that gets built 
in that weight room. And, and that to me is, is a huge piece of what we're trying to get done. Well, one of the first things you did when you got to Duke was, was basically interview the players and ask what, what they felt like they were getting out of the program, what they felt like they needed to get more of out of the program. And uh, I, I heard you say that, that in that particular case, you identified nutrition as a, as a point of emphasis that you, you needed to get fixed right away. Did you do the same thing at Texas A&M? Did, did you talk to all those players and, and what did you feel like you needed to, to attack right away after talking to them? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I did talk to all the players. It was a little different because I think I had a little bit more knowledge on what I felt like were some of the things that we needed to, to get better at. And, um, you know, I just we, – we maybe had to get just back to being a blue-collar program. I, I think mm -hmm. that probably more than anything. And that's, um, you know, something that, that is really critical when you – compile talent and you compile elite players from all over the country, how you tie those people together and connect those people together uh, and get those guys to understand that there's still a level of work ethic that's required in order to elevate to the levels you really want to get to uh, that, that became our focus, right? And, and some of that is, you know, simple as, you know, coming to meals together, sitting down, putting your phone away and having conversations with your teammates to, you know, maybe a little bit different approach to what we're doing in strength and conditioning or some of the different things we're doing from a, a team building standpoint in the off season. Just a lot of different little nuances that you can build into your off season program to help pull all of this thing really together. One of the things that struck me about the, the first Duke team you had was that you saw the personality of that team pretty much from day one watching them play. How much of that was instilled now in the in the offseason program? And, had, and how's, that, how's that working with, with these current guys? Yeah, I think all of it's instilled now. I think this is the time of year where you get to focus on who your identity is or what are those intangible factors that you want to define yourself as. I think – the closer you get to the season, the more ball centric all of your conversation has to become because, you know, pretty soon there's going to be a game plan for how we're going to go out and try to beat Notre Dame. And then that's going to take the, the priority over everything. But along the way, you can't lose sight of of some of these, you know, some of the grit, some of the mental toughness, some of the togetherness, some of the culture things that you have to do in order to have the program be as successful as you want it. And, and now is the best time of year for that. You know, there's no football. You're not really, there's no, you're not stressed up against the time gun to get things ready. Um, you get to really just dive in and focus on those things and building that foundation the way you want to. You, you brought in Colin Klein as your offensive coordinator. You talk about grit and, and you know, that kind of program. That's what he played in at Kansas State. That's what he coached in, uh, in, in Chris Kleiman's administration at, at Kansas State. How did you, how did you, decide that that he was the guy because you guys your pass hadn't crossed had they no so so i did you know my 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 process in that is is similar I, I what i do is i sit down and i watch guys that i think make sense for us and and study them as if i was a defensive coordinator and just kind of look through the schematic challenges they present how they sequence plays how they maneuver their offense throughout the season and you know did that with with a handful of, of potential candidates that i thought made sense and uh, then got a chance to kind of hone in on Colin and, and really talk to him and spend some quality time with him. And, and, you know, you talked about being in a gritty program. He's also about as gritty a quarterback as there ever was. In yeah, football. exactly. So, um, you know, I just think it, it kind of matched and you know, he's a great human. He's extremely intelligent. He's very bright. He's got a really good feel and pulse on how he wants to attack defenses. Uh, and I think our, our, philosophies married very well together our personalities married very well together and he's obviously been a great addition for us here and you guys open with notre dame you mentioned that that's obviously a game that, that everybody's excited to see but how weird is it going to be you go to a new school notre dame comes to town and it's your quarterback riley littered from duke yeah. 
it's it's uh it's the modern era of college football right this is this is how it goes nowadays and uh you know obviously i got so much respect for riley and, and he's such a great kid and a great quarterback and a great competitor and uh you know i, I pick an awful lot of quarterbacks i'd rather have be on the other sideline for me and my opener than him but you know it, it is what it is and that's the world we live in today and so uh, i think there's a lot of mutual respect between the two of us but i think he knows like i know we're both high level competitors too and so for those three and a half hours uh, we won't be rooting for each other. And then, uh, then we'll shake hands and, and wish each other the best for the rest of the year. Well, I can't wait to see that game. I can't wait to see what, what your team looks like. Coach, thank you so much for the time. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, Andy. We'll do it again sometime. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On3Sports YouTube channel.